Welcome. A very good Sunday morning to you. I'm so glad we're getting to spend this time together. We're diligently working on reopening our facilities, and so I recommend you stay connected with us. Uh, check your emails, uh, check our website, uh, check our social media accounts, uh, because a lot of that information will be going through those options, and uh, we want you to be up to speed on, on real-time decisions that we're making and the options that we'll have and when they'll be available. Um, also, while you're online today, uh, it's very easy just to watch a screen and kind of disengage. And I would just encourage you, you know, there, there are ways to engage uh, when we're together like this. And uh, uh, so saying good morning to everyone when you, when you sign on to the live or, or Facebook live option. Um, if you hear something that you agree with, you know, giving an amen or repeating the comment or even asking a question because we, we have people who are interested in responding to that. But we want to serve you really well, so I hope you take advantage of all of that. We're continuing our, our series in the parables, the, the short stories of Jesus. And they're not just intended to distract or entertain. They're intended to inform, to give us insight to things that are not obvious about God that are not obvious about his kingdom or our world or ourselves. And so this morning, we're going to look at the story of a rich fool. And uh, those two words don't always go together, but they do in this story. We're in Luke chapter 12, and uh, beginning in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you? And then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life or your soul will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. <laughs> it's a really compelling story. Uh, let's, let's start off with some questions this morning. So what would a successful life look like for you? If you were to consider yourself successful, what would that look like? For example, like, where would you be living if you considered yourself successful? What would you be wearing? Or what would you own if you considered yourself successful? Who would you be with? Who would you spend your time with if you considered yourself successful? What's interesting is if we can ask ourselves, where did that definition of success come from? How do we decide that's what a successful life looks like? And then another question is, do you consider yourself successful now? Um, for lots of people, they don't. And that's why this passage is so powerful, because God begins to shed some light on, on some insight as to what true success, true wealth is. So um, there was a man. He moved frequently. Uh, uh, around. Uh, respectable people often disapproved of him. He owned very little. He traveled not very far, never wrote a book, never owned a home. And he actually died the death of a common criminal before he was 35 years old. So was Jesus successful? And the answer is uh, uh, people of his time didn't think so. But I don't think anyone looking back through time would say that Jesus was not successful. So then what is success? If, if it's not just the accumulation of things, if it's not just having more than someone else, 
what is success? And I would like to offer this definition. Success is cooperating with God. Success is cooperating with God. That's not the same thing as trying to get God to cooperate with us. If you think about it, a lot of our prayers, a lot of our concerns are about trying to get God to agree with our definition of what a good plan or what success looks like. But I'd like us to think about this today. Success is cooperating with God. So the story begins like this. A person approaches Jesus, and he's frustrated about the fact that he didn't he wasn't included in an inheritance, and he wanted his brother to share it with him. So he asked Jesus to weigh in on this. Here's what you need to see. The man didn't want Jesus to rule in his heart. He wanted Jesus to rule in his favor. Very different thing. He's asking Jesus to make sure he gets something that he wants. And Jesus, when he hears this, he, he steps away from He's not interested in trying to be a judge in this situation. But he does diagnose what's going on beneath the surface. And he calls it out. There's a virus, and the virus is greed. And what he wants us to know is that we are not what we own. What he wants us to know is we might become what owns us. That can be a very scary thing. So Jesus tells a story, and he's not changing the topic. He's not, he's not trying to avoid or, or distract from what he just said. He wants to go deeper. He wants to bring more out into the light and into the open, not only for this man's heart, but I think for ours as well. So he says that there's a man. He's already rich. There was a certain rich man, and he has an exceptional yield of harvest in a particular season. In fact, so much that he doesn't have enough barn or, or storage area to contain all of it. And his automatic assumption, the first thing that comes to his mind, more barns, more grain. And the question is, why? Why does he think that? And he tells us why. He said, because now I will be able to eat and drink and be merry. What is he telling us? Now I can finally relax. Now I can disengage. In fact, the original language of that word says, now I can be exempt from some things in life. And that's what he sees. That's what he's looking at. And while he is planning his easy life, his exempt life, his disengaged life, his worry-free life, his comfort-filled life, God interrupts his thoughts with a rather remarkable statement. A voice tells him, this is the end of your life, and you are a fool. Um, that, that is a really harsh thing to hear. If you look at this man, you notice that he uses the word I and my when he's talking to himself. What will I do with my crops? I will tear down this. I will build up that. I will store my surplus grain. I will say to myself. It's absolutely amazing how self-focused he is. And God interrupts that. You know, when, when we get caught in this kind of trap of more, it's hard to know if we possess things or if they actually possess us. I'm not just saying that in kind of a figurative way. Um, when we have something and it requires our time, our energy, we're concerned about it. We work around it. We make sure it is taken well care of. It, it's hard to know that... Uh, that that doesn't actually own us, that we are the servant of that instead of the other way around. This man is actually about to go from this world into the next world. And I'm sure you've heard the phrase, you know, you can't take it with you. Nothing he has is going to go with him. His barns, his grain, all the stuff that he possesses, it's going to stay. Except something. There is something that will go with him, and that's his thoughts. His thoughts are going with him. I, I think this is possibly true. That the way you think right now, if your life ended right now, is the way you will think forever. That should 
cause us to think very soberly about how we use our thoughts, how we entertain our thoughts, what we are building mentally in our life. This man was a wealth addict, and what I want you to know is you actually don't have to be rich to be a wealth addict. If your purpose is to always have more, then that impulse begins to control our decision-making. There's lots of options that will be in front of us, but we'll always choose the more option. If you can't imagine a good life without more stuff, then there's a really good chance you've been infected with the virus of greed. And Jesus wants to draw this out. He wants to cleanse us from. He wants to heal us. He, he wants to give us antibodies to this process of greed. So Jesus came to give us more than more. If all we're looking for is more stuff, we should know that that's not why Jesus came. He says that your life is not defined by the number of possessions, the, the things that you have. That there is an eternal part of you, and it is going to outlast the sun and the stars when they no longer shed any light in our universe, when they have exploded and contracted down to virtually nothing. You are still going to exist. Your thoughts are not going to cease when your body is placed in a casket. Your emotions don't have to be controlled by whether you have what you want or not. Your decisions don't have to be driven by a financial bottom line, that, that there are other ways to think, there are other ways to live. You were made for relationship with God and with others, and nothing you own, nothing you own will take the place of that. I want to say that again. You were made for relationship with God and with others, and nothing you own can ever take the place of that. So Jesus, in this, this conversation, in the telling of the story, uses a really unusual phrase, someone who is not rich toward God. What does that mean, not rich toward God? Well, the first thing I, I would say is that we don't earn our wealth with God, that God is the one who's given to us. Uh, we don't have uh, a paycheck from God. We have an inheritance from God. To be rich for, uh, toward God means that you're passionate about what God wants. You're actually interested in and excited by. You're, you're, you have an adventure in discovering God's will, not just trying to clarify your own will and getting him to sign on. That you see opportunities, you see resources, you see people very differently. You see that there's a reason for things coming together, and it's not just to obtain more. There's something else that's going on that God has a different agenda. So a truly rich person, a truly wealthy person is someone who's able to share. A truly rich person, someone who can share. You can have astonishing wealth and cling to it, not let any of it go, which goes back to the question, are you clinging to it or is it clinging to you? A person who's rich toward God can be generous, generous with their time because they're not afraid they're going to waste their time. I think we have a lot of time poor people in our world. They act like they have none of it. And God gives us time every day. We can be generous with our love because we're not afraid that we're going to run out or it will be wasted. We're not afraid that something won't come back to us if I love someone. It's a generosity. We can be rich toward God when we, we are generous with our empathy, that we're not afraid to feel something other than comfort, that we can actually enter into the feelings of others. We can be generous with our actions because I'm not afraid. We're not afraid that if I do something that somehow I have wasted or lost, but God is actually doing something with that. To be rich toward God means you allow him to share us with others. You are the treasure. You are what God wants to share. He values you above all things, and he doesn't want to cling and hoard you. He wants to release you unto your potential and to the difference that can be made in our world. So the rich fool's life didn't end when his heart stopped beating. It ended when his heart stopped caring. 
It happened to him. It can happen to us. Abundant living that Jesus promises doesn't require bigger things or better things because there's more to life than more. So if your purpose is to eat and to drink and to be merry, if your purpose is to have more than you need, uh, then it's likely you've already started dying. And that's not what God wants for us. If your purpose is to be rich toward God, that is how you start living. So I'd like us to just take a couple of minutes and pray today. Uh, Father, we certainly are told by our culture, media, the many voices that fill our world that we're worth more if we have more. And you seem to upend that. You seem to say that our worth has been established by your gift to us, not what we possess. And that we can make a bigger difference when we're willing to be generous. So I ask that you would help us to identify the virus of greed when it shows up in our hearts. That we stop assuming that if I have newer, faster, bigger, better, shinier, more expensive things, that that's when my life will actually have meaning. Our meaning is found in what you did for us on a cross. And that there's an abundant life that can be engaged in, and it doesn't require a certain bottom line in our bank account. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.